Coming up on State of Events, we take a look at a few of the propositions that will be on the ballot for today's election. New studies take climate scientists by surprise as they find out low-lane communities may be under the high tide line sooner than originally thought. And State of Events starts now. Welcome to State of Events. I'm Graham Muckenfoos. And I'm Jennifer Rios. Let's get down to our top story for this week. Ukraine's military has postponed a second stage of weapons pullback in the country's conflict-ridden east, drawing criticism from the Kremlin's envoy to a group trying to help end the fighting. The military said the pullback near the town of Petrovsky, which was tentatively set for Monday, could not be conducted because of recent ceasefire violations since, since 2014 Ukrainian forces and Russian-backed separatists have fought in a war that has killed more than 13,000 people. A Ukrainian heavy weapons pullback elsewhere in the east last week raised hopes that a stumbling peace process was advancing. However, Boris Grislov, Russia's representative to the contact group of Ukraine, says, quote, We are once again convinced that the main reason for the stalling of the process is the position of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, end quote. Last week, the House of Representatives voted to a formal inquiry into the impeachment of Donald Trump. The divided House voted 232 to 196 to approve the resolution. This is how rules for an impeachment process, including the establishing as a public trial and puts the ball in motion for an actual impeachment hearing. The vote has done in response to Republicans claiming that Democrats were not following correct procedures despite following procedures for impeachment that the Republican Party itself established prior to Trump's presidency. Under this news transparency, the Democratic probe has released the full transcripts of their impeachment inquiry that happened behind closed doors with witnesses, including the former U.S. ambassador of Ukraine. The Trump, president, the Trump administration is scrambling to counter impeachment proceedings by attempting to block out or install key figures from testifying, such as Robert Blair, a top national security aide who participated in the call to Ukraine. All of this comes as Trump lost a case in New New York, which mandates him to release the last eight years of his tax returns to Manhattan prosecutors, something that Trump has hidden unlike any other sitting U.S. president since 1974. According to CAL FIRE, Kincaid Fire is 80% contained with the fire spreading over 77,000 acres and 121 square miles. As of Sunday afternoon, Sonoma County Sheriff's Office and CAL FIRE had all remaining mandatory evacuation orders for the Kincaid Fire in Sonoma County, were reduced to warnings on Sunday evening. CAL FIRE confirmed in an incident report that authorities are in the final stages of repopulating the impacted areas. At the Wildflowers Peak, about 180,000 residents were displaced by the fire. CAL FIRE also says its damage inspection process is 100% complete in total. 374 buildings were destroyed, 174 homes, 11 commercial buildings, and 189 other structures. A total of 60 structures, 34 of them being homes, were damaged. On Monday, CAL FIRE says just over 3,200 personnel remain assigned to containment and mop-up efforts on the fire, which CAL FIRE estimates will be fully contained by about Thursday. Figuring out what's real and what's not on social media can be tricky. Social media platforms like Facebook have been scrutinized for deciding not to remove political ads from their platform despite much controversy. Twitter, on the other hand, has banned all political advertisements. With much controversy about whether certain political ads should be available on social media platforms, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey announced that Twitter will be halting all political advertisements across its social media platforms starting November 22nd. Dorsey tweeted, while internet advertising is incredibly powerful and very effective for commercial advertisers, that power brings significant risks to politics, where it can be used to influence votes to affect the lives of millions. He also tweeted, a political message earns reach when people decide to follow an account or retweet. We believe this decision should not be compromised by money. One of Twitter's competitors, Facebook, face scrutiny after choosing not to censor politicians even at the possibility of spreading misinformation. I think lying is bad, and I think if you were to run an ad that had a lie, that would be bad. So you won't take down lies or you will take down lies? I think it's just a pretty simple yes or no. In a democracy, okay. I believe that people should be able to see for themselves what politicians that they may or may not vote for so are you saying won't take judge them their down. character for themselves. Because Twitter is so closely associated with news and politics, taking a stand on political ads would improve its standing with users without financial costs. 
Many Democrats praised Twitter's decision, while President Trump's campaign manager, Brad Pascal, called it, quote, it's another way to silence conservatives. Twitter is doing this because Twitter is a platform that is so closely aligned with news and politics. Axios media reporter Sarah Fisher says that Twitter's decision is not about money, but sending a message that certain types of free expressions can do more harm than good. So many people were abusing the system, lying in ads. They were very hard to regulate. And I think that it's doing what it thinks is best for its community. Anti-government protests in the Chilean capital of Santiago are approaching their third consecutive week. The Chilean capital of Santiago has been paralyzed by these protests, leaving at least 20 dead and leading to a resignation of eight key ministers from President Sebastián Piñera's cabinet last week. The protests initially began over a now-suspended price hike for subway tickets in Santiago, but have since expanded, revealing anger among Chileans who feel now they have been excluded from the nation's economic rise. Demonstrators are demanding action from the government to foster an environment of greater economic equality. Many of the protesters are now asking for Pineda's resignation. Today is election day in San Francisco as the city holds general elections for mayor, sheriff, city and district attorneys, among others. San Francisco voters will also be voting on five ballot measures today, propositions A through F. Here are some important propositions you should know about. Proposition A also known as the San Francisco Bond Issue for Affordable Housing, proposes a $600 million bond be allocated to affordable housing, which includes $150 million for public housing and $220 million for low-income housing. A yes vote authorizes the bond, while a no vote rejects it. Proposition C, maybe the most discussed proposition on the ballot, focuses on the city's attempt to authorize and regulate the sale of e-cigarettes and vapes. After a series of deaths across America were tied to the e-cigarette company Juul, the product came under scrutiny. A yes vote in favor of the proposition would authorize the sale of e-cigarettes in the city and would overturn city laws designed to ban products not approved by the FDA. A no vote would keep these products off the shelves. Proposition D proposes a tax on rideshare companies such as Uber and Lyft to improve public transportation. A yes vote would authorize a tax of 1.5% of total fares on shared rides with the revenue intended to maintain and improve infrastructure. If you can, make sure to go out and vote today. We'll have the results to today's election next week here on State of Events. New updates on record-breaking numbers among U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. State of Events correspondent Jennifer Rios tells us why and who is driving these numbers. Jennifer? Yeah, Graham, in the past year alone, we have seen nearly an increase of active arrests at the U.S.-Mexico border, record number of 342 percent. These arrests mainly consisting of migrant families and their children that have attempted to seek asylum here in the U.S. in the past year alone. Crisis isn't over. The bottom line for us is Congress still needs to pass meaningful legislation to address our broken legal framework if we're going to have a durable, meaningful, and lasting solution to this crisis. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Mark Morgan, there has been nearly 470,000 arrests at the U.S. border alone in the last fiscal year, and all being family members. The U.S. reaching record numbers of families and unaccompanied children that have been apprehended over the past year. Authorities have also taken nearly 76,000 unaccompanied children into federal custody, all arrests stemming from family members attempting to seek asylum in the United States. The Trump administration has only extended temporary protections for El Salvadorians for an additional 12 months under TPS, a form of humanitarian relief. This will further grant those who are currently under temporary protected status work permit validity under the Department of Homeland Security that will continue going into January 2021, although a judge had already blocked the administration's move to terminate these protections. Reporting in San Francisco, I'm Jennifer Rios for State of Events. Last week, scientists from Climate Central published a new research paper showing rising sea levels have been miscalculated in previous projections. This updated research reveals three times as many people could be affected by rising tide levels by 2050. We really need to know two things to understand the human vulnerability to sea level rise. And one is the height of the sea, but the other is the height of the land. We all assumed that we knew that that it was fixed and simple. We took a closer look at the data being used to estimate land elevations globally. The data set used for global analysis and most of Asia and the rest of the world 
overestimated coastal elevations by more than six feet or two meters. The elevation was based on measurements taken from satellites. So basically the sensing beams that came down were very broad in their footprint and so averaged in uh, rooftops, buildings, treetops with the ground in determining the actual ele in, in determining the elevation uh, in the data set. 50 million people may be below the high tide line in this century. Most of the areas that will be affected are impoverished and developing communities in countries such as Vietnam, Thailand, parts of China, India, Iraq, and Egypt. Former New York medical examiner and famed pathologist Dr. Michael Baden is coming forward to claim evidence on the death of convicted pedophile ringleader Jeffrey Epstein points to murder. Epstein was scheduled to be put on trial to expose big economic and political figures involved in his pedophilic sex slave ring when he was found dead in his cell back in August. He was supposed to be on 24-7 on suicide watch, yet both guards fell asleep, plus the cameras in and around his cell were not recording. Dr. Baden says that Epstein's autopsy showed multiple fractures in the bones of his neck, which are more consistent with homicidal strangulation than suicidal hanging. New York's current medical examiner, examiner, Dr. Barbara Sampson, stands by her ruling of suicide, citing that those bones, while more often broken during homicides, can be found in suicide cases. U.S. Department of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos spoke last Wednesday says there's an achievement crisis in U.S. schools. This comes after the nation's report card shows a drop in the average reading score since 2017 from grade levels between 4th and 6th grade. She says that they should be less involved in education. Government has ne never made anything better or cheaper, more effective or more efficient. And nowhere is that more true than in education. DeVos plans to push for more power to local school districts with her proposition of the Education Freedom Scholarships, which would give a tax credit for parents who send their kids to schools outside their district. The idea was quickly under fire as Democrats and teachers unions said that it would only be sending the public funds to private schools and schools who benefit from these ventures. Next on State of Events, we take a closer look into who PG&E is, its bankruptcy, and what it means for its customers. And then... My co-anchor sits down one of SF State's athletes to learn more about this journey through soccer. When it's time to choose healthcare for your teen, you want the best. When it's time for your team's questions to be answered, you want a professional you can trust. At Valencia Health Services, your time is well spent. We provide professional, quality healthcare. Valencia Health Services, dedicating quality time to professional healthcare because your teen's health is our first priority. Valencia Health Services, quality time because we care. Welcome back to State of Events. With all the recent fires in PG&E news lately, we here at State of Events wanted to take a closer look in order to find out what kind of company PG&E is and what the company's recent bankruptcy means for its customers. PG&E is a privately owned corporation who answers to their private investors and shareholders. Compare this to a publicly owned company who can sell its shares amongst the public for all, while privately owned companies can individually choose a select few willing to invest. Privately owned usually means higher incentives and money for the company and its investors. PG&E filed for bankruptcy in January because of the liabilities posed by the 2017 and 2018 California fires. The company currently struggles to pay insurance claims of $30 billion to fire victims. 
Bankruptcy or not, customers can expect higher costs of premiums and a smaller workforce, which ultimately is counterintuitive to PG&E's safety and energy goals. The San Francisco State student who was fatally shot weeks ago has now been identified. 21-year-old Vilea Villa Gomez was fatally shot near Lowell High School on October 24th. Vila Gomez's boyfriend, Jose de Jesus Rodriguez, allegedly shot her in the head with the revolver after allegedly physically abusing her. Police arrested Rodriguez on suspicion of murder and domestic violence. The incident is the 32nd reported homicide in San Francisco this year. I sat down with one of our campus athletes whose path to San Francisco State has been a unique one. I've been away from my family five years. And you think every time it gets easier, but I mean, every time I just say goodbye to them, it's every time it's harder and harder. Santiago Sarmiento is a defender for the San Francisco State men's soccer team. His story is very different from most other student athletes on campus, however. It begins in Bogota, Colombia, a home he left at only 16 without his family. And I always wanted to play soccer for the highest level I can. I was a lot of fights with my parents saying whether I should drop my studies and just go play somewhere or finish studying. So with my parents, we came up with the idea just to study abroad. And we found the school in Orlando, one of the best academies and schools where you can study and play at the highest level. Through three years and three national championships at boarding school, Sarmiento wasn't given much in the way of personal freedoms. This prompted a move to San Francisco upon graduation. I just wanted to go to a city where I could just walk out and just explore different parts, have a different thing to do every day. He then made the move from USF to San Francisco State. When I heard about the, the possibility of going as a state, I really liked how they play. I felt like that's the way I wanted to play. Sarmiento is going to pursue a master's degree in sports management upon graduation. Soccer is what has gotten him to his current position in life, and it will continue to be a driving force moving forward. Soccer has completely changed my life. It made me the person who I am today, made me mature, made me more responsible, made me everything I am now. Sarmiento is an academic standout and intends to go on to get his master's degree in sports management en route to his goal of working for a professional soccer team. A year from October, every American will need a new driver's license that will meet federal security requirements in order to fly domestically. TSA urges travelers not to wait until the last minute to be issued this new identification. This new license is an enhanced version of licenses that will be required for an additional safety measures after a 9-11 terrorist attacks. But just in case you forget, they're still able to use your passport in the meantime. Deadspin, the formerly Gawker-owned sports website, saw its news flow go dry by Friday morning. The entire Deadspin staff was gone. Former Deadspin editor Megan Greenwell, who left last summer after clashes with its owner, tweeted Friday morning. And with what it's over, Deadspin no longer employs a single writer or editor. I am gutted but so proud, proud of this group of people. Deadspin was a good website. On Thursday morning, at least a dozen Deadspin editors and writers elected to quit over a management edict to stick to sports. While Deadspin was founded in 2005 as a site focused on sports, it has branched out into several coverage areas, from the Arch and the Waggish to more serious political and social commentary. Private equity firm Great Hill Partners bought the former Gawker portfolio from Univision in April, creating a new holding company called Geo Media. Other sites in the acquisition by GEO include Hilopinic and Jezebel Splinter, a, pol a politics-oriented site, shut down a few weeks ago. Next on State of Events, John Cena steps off the screen and out of the ring for a good cause through Twitter. And in sports, 49ers can't stop and won't stop as they continue to dominate the NFC West. Daddy, what is sustainability? Sustainability? Yeah, sustainability. Well, it's composting. Cool. It's conserving water. What about clothes? You can reuse clothes too. Are you ready for school?
Welcome back to State of Events. Alondra Vega has the latest in entertainment news. Take it away, Alondra. Thanks, guys. There's a lot to cover this week, so let's get right to it. The man who once predicted the stars is now one. Iconic astrologist Walter Mercado died this past weekend. Mercado was known for his daily horoscopes, advice, astrological predictions on Spanish television. He shared his vast knowledge of the stars for 15 years on Univision. Mercado was known for his extravagant and whimsical cloaks and dresses. Mercado was an icon to Latino television culture. He was 87. Apple releases a new addition to the AirPods family with all new features. The AirPods Pro is a solution for your regular AirPods not fitting securely in your ear. The new model includes noise-canceling ear tips that contour your ears. Now you can go to, to the gym without worrying that your AirPods will fall out. Also, the new AirPods Pro is sweat and water resistant. The AirPods Pro is now available at Apple stores for $249. The Popeye's chicken sandwich is back by popular demand. The fast food restaurant relaunched its famous chicken sandwich this weekend. On Sunday to be exact. Sorry, Chick-fil-A. The line to order the sandwich was just as worse as last time. Some drivers in the drive through lines expanded all the way into the streets. But who can blame them? Just look at the sandwich. The sandwich is really tender with all white meat, coated with buttermilk and Louisiana styled seasonings, smashed between two warm toasted brioche buns. Delicious. John Cena is using his Twitter platform for a good cause. In a tweeted video, the actor tells his followers about his new movie, Playing With Fire. Cena plays the role of a first responder in the movie. He also mentions in the video that he believes first responders are heroes and asked Paramount to donate $500,000 to charity that aids first responders. Paramount Pictures is distributing Cena's new film and responded to his tweet. Paramount chose two charities to donate, the CA Fire Foundation and the a LAF Foundation. The first responders have been battling numerous wildfires in Northern and Southern California this month. November is here, and you know what that means. Tis the season for Mariah Carey. The pop star is celebrating the 25th anniversary of her Christmas song, All I Want for Christmas is You. To celebrate, the singer released a deluxe anniversary edition of her Merry Christmas album. The album includes all the smash hits from All I Want for Christmas Is You. The song has charted every holiday season since its release in 1994. And that's all I have for today's entertainment roundup. Back to you guys at the desk. So, Grandma, are you going to buy me that Mariah Carey album this, for this week, Santa? Well, first of all, I'm not supposed to tell you what I'm going to buy for Secret Santa, but if you must know, I usually buy the NSYNC Christmas album. Oh, Graham, it's not 1999. <laughs> Thanks, Alondra, for filling us in on what's going on in the entertainment world. In the sports corner, Natasha Casino has some important news on San Francisco State sports and professional Bay Area sports. Take it away, Natasha. Thanks, Graham. We begin as usual with our campus sports. Volleyball's game in Sonoma last week was postponed due to power outages. However, they did play on Saturday against Cal State Monterey Bay and ended a two-game losing skid, winning the match in four sets. They moved to seven and five in conference play. The soccer teams made a disappointing trip to Humboldt State over the weekend, where both teams lost on Saturday afternoon. The women's team lost an overtime thriller, 1-0. They fall to 0-10 in conference play. The men's team scored first in their match, but relinquished three goals in the second half and lost 3-1, causing them to move to six and four in conference play. Both soccer teams play here Thursday against Cal State LA, Volleyball visits Chico State tomorrow and plays here on Friday against Humboldt State. Senior night for volleyball is here on Saturday. They play Sonoma State. Halfway through the season, the 49ers have an unblemished record. Graham took a look at how the unexpected has unfolded thus far. Garoppolo finds Dwelly, and that first down is going to end it. The 49ers are 8-0 for the first time since 1990, and it's a monumental departure from last season. After eight games last year, the team boasted only a 2-6 and six record, prompting the question, what's changed this year? The simple answer would be quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo is back from injury. But looking at the numbers, Jimmy G really hasn't seemed all that impressive. Screen pops up in the air, picked off! So what else is different? The answer is the defense. Led by rookie Nick Bosa, the defense is only allowed the second most points behind the Patriots and are the number one pass defense in the league. They are also the third best in sacks. Bosa himself is tied for seventh in the league in sacks and tied for second in tackles for loss. 
It's not all just the defense, however. While Garoppolo has been underwhelming for much of the season, he showed Thursday that when the defense is underperforming, he can take over. He threw for 317 yards and four touchdowns in a win against the Cardinals, in which the defense gave up 25 points. And with the acquisition of star wide receiver Emmanuel Sanders, who had 112 yards and a touchdown Thursday, the team is poised to continue this run of dominance. The 49ers play their next game against the Seahawks on Monday Night Football next week in a game that could have some serious playoff implications. The Raiders celebrated their first game in Oakland in seven weeks with a 31-24 win. The Raiders scored first with a two-yard rush by running back Josh Jacobs. The defense had some big plays as well, including this incredible interception in the end zone by cornerback Daryl Worley. The game was close throughout. And although the Raiders called with a timeout with only seconds left, giving the Lions a chance to score, the defense came up big again and sealed the victory for the silver and black. The Raiders are now 4-4 four and four and play the Chargers on Thursday night football this week. In the NBA, the Warriors pulled out a surprise win against the Portland Trailblazers last night. Rookie Eric Pascal had the best game of his career on his 23rd birthday, with 34 points and 13 rebounds in the victory. The game was close throughout. Oakland native Damian Lillard had 39 points and hit some clutch shots late, but came up short. Kai Bowman added 19 points and got under the skin of Blazers center Hassan Whiteside late. The Warriors outlasted the Blazers, winning the game 127-118. to They play in Houston against the Rockets tomorrow. The Washington Nationals took home the World Series trophy last week. The World Series this year had many unexpected twists and turns. For starters, neither team won a game at home, something that has never happened in a best of seven series in North American sports history. It featured two small market teams, one of which, the Nationals, had never been to the Fall Classic before. Garrett Cole, arguably the best pitcher for either team, was available off the bench for Game 7, but oddly never made an appearance. It all culminated in an exciting Game 7 win for the Washington Nationals and Steven Strasburg took home World Series MVP. That does it for the sports wrap-up. Volleyball plays tomorrow, the Raiders play Thursday, and the 49ers have an exciting Monday night football matchup this week. It should be fun. Back to you guys at the desk. That's all we have for this edition of State of Events. To stay up to date with all news around San Francisco State, follow us on Twitter at state underscore of underscore events and check out our KSFS YouTube channel. For State of Events, I'm Jennifer Rios. And I'm Graham Muckenfoos. Stay cool out there, San Francisco.